Welcome to Sunday Soul Day, weekly fuel for your mind, body, and soul. Today we have digital futurist and thought partner, Jenna Wendt. She's a trailblazer in the tech industry with over a decade of experience in SaaS digital product development, as well as a systems thinker. And she envisions the future of work in digital transformation, amplifying the voices of Black women and BIPOC individuals. Welcome to Sunday Soul Day, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Finally, yes. get, on, get on here. I've been I following know. you guys' work. so I Thank know. You. And good morning, Allie. How are you? Good morning. Hi, Demisha. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, Allie. Yeah, Allie is feeling a little under under the weather, but you look wonderful. So um, we are so excited to get started and just learn a little bit about Jenna. She and I actually met um, through Arlen Hamilton's community. Shout out to Arlen, the amazing Arlen Hamilton and her AAA community. If you are an entrepreneur, definitely check it out. Um, and we met at one of her events that she had in LA and um, ended up sitting right next to each other and <laughs> hit it off instantly. Yep. Um, and I was so excited for what she was building. So can't wait to share with you guys a little bit more. Um, but Jenna, tell us a little bit about like kind of your journey that led you into the tech industry. Yeah, so my journey started with the Google search, actually. I was supposed to be either becoming a lawyer or an urban planner. So I'll just go back like a little bit further. In undergrad, I studied urban uh, poli-sci, political science, and I was supposed to be um, a lawyer. But I did an internship at, well, he was a senator at that time, but um, I did it, our president, Joe Biden, I did an internship there when he was a senator um, of course, we don't know what things are going to be happening, but <laughs> did that internship and I was like, oh my God, this is so boring. Like, I cannot envision myself being a lawyer. And let me just tell you how the experience started out. Like, I'm sure this is not going to affect how anyone feels about Joe Biden because it's Joe Biden and he wasn't actually there. I never met him. But when I, I was wearing my hair natural, I'll never forget. I was wearing my hair naturally. And so I had like this big uh, twist out and I kind of had it up like in a puff. If you don't know what that means, that's like when you um, are a person of color, you wear your hair like in its natural state and you kind of put it up into this bun. Got to the internship, did well, like took all this notes on how to present yourself as a college student. Like I was dressed professionally. I had resume, all the things. Right. And I got the internship, but as I was leaving, there was a, a black guy that was in the interview. He was part of um, not HR, but just someone working there that would be supervising. And he pulled me into his office and he said, you cannot wear your hair like that to um, come here and work here. And I was like, excuse me? But I mean, at that time I was a college student. I didn't know how to advocate in a situation like that. I was just trying mm -hmm. to get an internship. I got the internship, but I just like never forgot that. And so that remained in my mind. Like I think as I went professionally, I didn't ever want to be in an environment that was like that or care that much about that. So anyway... Um, I got there. It was boring. That incident happened. <sighs> I was like, I was at one point I was signing letters. Um, so if you don't know, like what happens in these congressional offices is like they'll get interns or entry level people to like sign letters from the from the folks. So like newsflash, if you've ever written a letter, the person probably never read it, like the congressperson, the senator, the president, like none of those people, they probably- I'm sure you're never... breaking all kinds of hearts right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> they but... never read it because yeah. someone like me was probably in charge of like, they have a thing where it, it's already pre-signed by the, per like it's in the person's, yeah. so kind of you... like a stamp yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So it's in their signature and you just stamp it, you just like go through this. And I was like, this cannot be life. So I just- completely pivoted from that. And I was like, I don't, I can't be a lawyer. It takes too much to get through. And I don't really see the ROI on the other side of doing this. So then I 
went on to be a urban planner, or so I thought. I went to grad school with the Ohio State University, um, was going through, enjoying the program. I thought I was going to come out, maybe work at a private firm, helping like with community development. Um, then there was a recession, no jobs, especially not in a private sector. So I was, once again, need to pivot. That's when I went into the Google search and I just said, I, what can you do with a political science and an urban planning uh, advanced degree? And one of the things that came up was technical writing. And I was like, I know I can do that. So I was like, this is it. Like, I'm just going to do this. I think this is going to be what's right. So I branded myself as that. Never had any formal training. Just took what I had, transferable skills, whatever Google told me, put it on the resume, started like meeting other people that were technical writers, um, joined professional organizations. And then I became a technical writer at that point. Oh my goodness. That was quite a journey. And I love that you, um, even though, you know, they asked you to change your, your hair, uh, and alter your appearance that, that really stuck with you and that you found, you know, opportunities outside of that, that allowed you to shine as you, you know? Yeah. Um, after that point, I kind of just was, I remember like something my mom used to tell me, like, if you, because I used to get in trouble a lot for talking, which no surprise, I'm here. So, oh <laughs> so she would always say like, okay, well, I know if they, you know, it, on your report card, if it says like talking, I'm not going to listen to that. Like, you're not going to get in trouble for that. As long as your grades are good, like who cares about the talking or whatever, as long as you're not like disrupting the class or whatever, disrespecting the teacher. So I, I would always remember that. And I kind of took that to mean like, if your skills and your contributions are where they, where they need to be, like nothing else is going to matter. Like that's going to put you where you need to be. Yeah. That yeah. And being a good human. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just had one follow-up question because I wanted to talk a little bit more about your tech career. Um, like, what is your role in tech? Like your current role, how did you get into that? Because you are you have such a great design background. Yeah, so um, technical writing led me into UX. Um, so user experience, for those mm -hmm. listening, um, basically you design whatever the product or the website looks like. So you don't code, but you work with somebody that does code to design and format and um, give a look and feel to how an experience is supposed to look. And when I found what that was, um, again, lemons to lemonade, I was laid off from technical writing. Um, I got with a really good agency, technical agency called, um, oh, I'm sorry, recruiting firm agency, staffing agency called uh, Aquient. And they have free courses that you can take. Um, no charge, doesn't matter if you're with them or not with them. Like you can go on to the site and take them now. I think it's called gymnasium. And that's where I got exposed to what UX was. I took the course, I was signed up with them. They, they went through the whole thing. They were gonna find me jobs um, that of course, fit my resume skill set. And I took the course. I loved it. I'm like, of course, I can design experiences. I know what that is. Um, and that's how I got into UX. I got some gigs or some freelance opportunities. Um, I did a few contracts and then landed my first role in UX, which was content um, strategy at Wells Fargo. So that's that's how I got in. Well, thank you for sharing your journey into tech. It's quite a journey. And I just wanted to make a quick comment regarding the how relatable it uh, it is uh, with your school situation growing up. I was the same way, got straight A's and a B in behavior because I was always talking all the time. And it's interesting the message that it tells us, right? So thank you for sharing. Yeah. 
There's a whole study on this. But I don't think we have time, but <laughs> there's a whole study on this and how um, I'm sure you guys have heard of it where they tell girls that are more talkative to kind of suppress that. And, and it's just kind of crazy, but yeah. Yeah. Well, no one's suppressed me. It doesn't sound like anyone's suppressed you either. So, no, but I do know, I do know some people got, that got suppressed. It's unfortunate, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it's so important for us to have that type of, that self-awareness to look back at these things that happen in childhood, um, because they're often clues to what you will either be passionate about or doing, um, like when you become an adult. So, yeah. So I want to ask you a question uh, regarding challenges and triumphs. So in your over 10 years of experience in SaaS digital product development, what have been the most significant challenges you've encountered and how did you overcome them? Conversely, what achievements or projects are you most proud of in your career? Um, okay, challenges. I would say the biggest challenges were at first not knowing, coming from a non-technical background. So this is still pre prevalent today, but especially when I started, everything was focused on coding, software engineers, developers. You know, that was the ro hot role. That's the role that's making the most money. That's the role that has the most opportunity. You know, they get laid off last kind of thing. They were supposed to be the most valuable people there at at, you know, earlier on. And so coming from, you know, experiencing that and that kind of bias, I think at, at first I was a little under, I was undervaluing my own skills that have now become my power skills because I didn't code. And so then I came and I came, also came from a self-taught background, didn't go to school for this, don't have any certifications even today in the beginning would kind of downplay or undervalue in my, not that anyone told me specifically, but me in my own mindset um, would undervalue certain skills that I now know or, and throughout my journey, like our power skills, such as uh, strategic thinking, um, stretch, such as communication skills. Um, one joke that we often have in tech is like, Developers mostly, I don't want to do a broad sweeping generalization, but a lot of times developers don't have the best um, communication skills. So uh, in that experience, I took that to mean that I had certain strengths that I know other people don't have and don't bring to the table. Uh, and so that makes me highly valuable and able to provide impact on on whatever project I'm on. Thank you for sharing about both sides, your struggles and uh, the areas that you're most proud of. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm curious, um, as we both, you know, were leaders and, and Black women in tech, um, have you faced like any specific challenges or opportunities related to being Black in the industry? Mm. Challenges that I would say maybe at the time I didn't even know they were challenges, but now that a lot of data, um, now that a lot of people share experiences on LinkedIn, they're way more transparent. I can look back and see like certain things <laughs> were not okay, like gaslighting, yeah. which happened. I mean, it happens now. So I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't even know what gaslighting was, you know, earlier on in my career. And so I think there's things that happen to Black women, um, women of color in these tech spaces where we make up, I think, 1%, could be 1.5. I don't know. We're in 2024. Let's give a 0.5. Who knows? Um, yeah, we're, we're very few in number. So I think a lot of things happen to uh, Black women that go swept under the rug, uh, not acknowledged. Um, yeah, suffering in silence, stuff like that. 
me specifically, I would say the the gaslighting was a big is a big deal even now. Um, I would say something that it 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 is a challenge, but I never really let it um, stop me, or I was able to push through the roadblocks. Are when um, I think I think this weird thing happens, especially when you're in a in a field within tech where you where you produce things like you you make things that don't necessarily exist, right? So in design, that's one of the reasons why I love design. It's like something can come from my head and then it exists in the world, which for me is like legacy. Like that's how I'm building my legacy in life, right? So I have gotten you get these comments like, well, where did you get this? Out of my mind. So, and it's just like, you have to just say it like that because if not, you will face these challenges where it's almost like people are trying to talk you out of your own zone of genius um, and make you to believe that the things that you are doing are not genius or they didn't come from you or you had to get this from somewhere else or you had to read this some other place or you stole this from wherever. Like, so yeah, that's, that's a big thing that I see happening all the time. Yeah. I call it the series of interrogation questions because yes. they, they, you know, I, and I've had this where um, people ask me the same question, you know, when I, develop a process or framework. You know, a particular yeah. framework or something. And they're like, Oh, where, you know, where'd you steal this from? Like, ha ha ha. And it's like, no, it's not a joke. I actually mm -hmm. worked really hard on this, you know? So, yeah. um, so it's interesting. And it, I love that you said that it's a way to kind of, you know, just minimize our genius, you know, and minimize yeah. our impact. That's what I have always um, experienced in having people, um, you know, white, male, white men, um, even non-whites as well, um, like just steal my work. And yeah, that was, that was another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is mind blowing one. to me. I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, I don't even know how you would do that. Like I couldn't steal someone's work and, and take the credit for it. You know, like yeah. that's something I love about Ali and I like in this, um, podcast, like she has never, ever once tried to take credit for, anything, you know, and she has no problem shining a light on my genius, you know, yeah. so I'm so appreciative of that, you know, like working with a non-Black person. Um, and, you know, that's, that's been my experience. So it's so interesting. Thank you, LinkedIn and all the beautiful Black women who are sharing on there, because you really, um, for me, especially going through some of the things that I've gone through, it felt like trauma, you know, in some cases. No, no, it is trauma. So I'm it's definitely trauma. And, and getting over. And, and the thing is, is I never, I realized I never took time to heal because yeah. I would literally leave a job on a Friday and then start on a Monday because in, in startups, you're usually working in kind of larger organizations, but in startups, it's like, we need you right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, you yeah. know? And so there's yeah. never enough time to, you know, takes time. So I've literally every I don't think I've ever taken time off. So um, until so, I finally planted my my uh, stick in the ground and was like, I'm pausing. <laughs> yeah, I have so many things to say to that. Um, mm. The which is I don't I don't know what uh, trauma this is, but the rushing of the candidate is also um, a disenfranchisement, right? Because when you rush a candidate like that, I'm, 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 I don't know all your what happened when you had to join the next company, like that. But a lot of times, women especially don't negotiate already, right? So when you rush a candidate, especially a BIPOC or a candidate of color, it it sends off all these signals like, oh my God, you know, desperation. I've got to just, and non-intentional thinking. Um, I got to just take this job. There's not going to be another opportunity. It kind of just fuels this anxiety. Then they don't properly research. Maybe they don't pay attention to red flags. Maybe they don't thoroughly read through all the little no. legalese or 
job description things that could throw you off. They don't negotiate their salary properly. So it's just a very uh, disenfranchising cycle, I feel. Yeah. Thank you. First, I want to thank Demisha for um, noticing that I'm not trying to take anyone's light. And I just want to um, thank you, Jenaba, for sharing and shedding a light on what people of color, particularly Black women, go through in the tech industry because I cannot relate, but I want to know and I want to be educated and I want to help educate other people. So I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you, Allie, for your um, advocacy. I love that. I love what you guys have here. Um, I did want to speak to, uh, and you'll have to jog my memory a little bit, that point before we talked about the rushing um, the candidate, we talked about something. Stealing the work? Yes, stealing the work. I wanted to bring back up, bring that back up because I've experienced uh, recently lots of um, sneaky stealing of the work, like creating a work culture, a quote unquote team culture where we have to have cult come culture of consensus, we have to have um, we, everything is we thinking, we contribution. And I think sometimes that goes unnoticed and until it's too late, where now here you are at annual review time and someone is, your manager's like, oh, you didn't, you didn't create this, like the team created this, or I don't see what your impact is because all year the team has been saying they did this or your your close counterpart over here, they did it. And I think that <laughs> that happens a lot. I see that you have to nip that in the bud. It's a very fine line because you can easily be labeled too much of an I person, right? And it's too much of an independent um, individual contributor where you're just you know, they'll kind of put a label on you like you're just eye focused, you have no teamwork, no collaboration. So it's a fine line where you have to balance both of those things. I was going to say it is a fine line. And one way that I coach people around that, um, and it's something that I had to learn to do for myself, um, is it's okay. Like I love a we culture. Like I'm really big on the we, like in making sure that people know that they're supported. And so if they drop the ball, your team is right there to catch it, you know? And so um, I don't want to, you know, come across as like, we're not, you know, for the we, I know Jenna is too, but at the same time, um, it's so important to document what you do. And so what I coach people around is really um, getting your work in writing. And so, um, and you don't have to share it with the whole team, but you can share it right with your direct manager and letting them know the impact that you played in that particular product that, you know, release, whatever, you know, the, the case is, um, but letting them know what that is and, or having it on, like, if you have a one-to-one -one, um, with that manager um, creating, you know, basically a paper trail. And yep. so that is, that is the best way to do it. So then come time of review, you now have a whole documentation, you know, of all the contributions that you did, but also the team, you know, cause we want to celebrate it all. People make, to make the mistake of thinking that the manager sees everything that they're doing or knows, right. Or yeah, it's just my manager. He know he or she knows, uh, what I've been doing, obviously, because they're my manager. And it's like, no, that's not, that is not how it goes. And I do want to encourage people to find a way to self-promote too, because the manager doesn't automatically know what you're doing or how great the thing is that, that you're working on is. So you can't. You, allies. You know, allies yeah. in the yeah. company. Self-promoting yeah. Everything you both are saying right now is so helpful. I work as a therapist that contracts with um, a program that where I work with uh, major tech companies. And what you're talking about right now is so prevalent. 
And we talk about how do you advocate for yourself? How do you take care of yourself? How do you leave a paper trail? And that whole idea of the manager doesn't see everything. And just, I think you saying this right now, both of you is really helpful so that other people, there's so many people in this position are like, oh, I'm not alone in this. And they really get such an anxiety and should I leave the company? And they stop eating, they stop sleeping. Like I see this several times a week, what you're describing. So thank you. People feel devalued. And that's really yeah. what it is. It's like, you yeah. know, and I've seen it time and time again. We, I have been in organizations, I, I worked in HR and talent, right? And so I'm very close to the people um, and touch all things people. And so like a lot of times people feel devalued by their managers, you know, when, when the manager isn't advocating for them for raises for, to, or even seeing them. But I'm like, your manager also has a whole life outside of work. And so give a little grace and understand that it's not the manager's job to do everything. Like you have to also advocate for yourself. Now in doing so, if your manager is not advocating, you know, then that's when you find allies go around that manager to make sure that, you know, you are being seen. And so, Oh um, yeah, that's a good one. I also wanted to say here, if possible, I, I mean, it should be, I don't know if it's legal or not, or Demisha, you can tell me if this is not accurate, <laughs> but you should be entitled to a, a skip level. Like you always want to start there just out of respect, right? But yep. then when things are not working, like go to, for me, I usually go direct across. So find another manager that's an ally. If that level is not, you know, working, yeah, you've, got, I go to the you've, next got level. you've got to find safety. Yeah. And, and when I say skip level, I don't, I don't mean like negatively because I've always had skip levels with the person right above, right? Um, I think it's just good to talk to them. E- and, and you, even if you don't even have, you know, concerns, you don't feel devalued, having that direct connection to the manager's manager and to hear their perspective, um, just to listen, just to even understand what do they, what do they care about? What are they concerned about? You know, those kinds of things. Um, what are their goals? What are they, what are their perspective on the team? and the work being done, I think that's like invaluable. Absolutely. And I wish those parameters would be put in place when you're going through new hire to have options because then people experience that lack of safety and then don't know where to turn or feel like they're doing something wrong. And even as you're saying, you don't know if it's even allowed. Um, so moving yeah. to, the, to the next question, this is this is great. Um, So as a leader in digital transformation and innovation, you bring a unique perspective to the tech industry. How do you see the landscape evolving and what key innovations do you anticipate shaping the future? Of course, I have to say AI because we're living in an AI world. Um, I am actively taking some courses in AI right now. Um, It's an AI design focused uh, course uh, certification. So I'm going to be taking that most likely. I think if you're not practicing out of curiosity or just reading, searching, trial and error on AI is a huge miss um, because there's people like myself who use AI every day. So when you put those two things in the work in the workplace, future of work, people who have no exposure, no practice are gonna fall behind naturally because they they they're not competitive. So I am encouraging everyone, it doesn't matter if you want to do it for your job, it doesn't matter if you want like a AI business side hustle or whatever, but just LinkedIn has free courses on on AI. Just go, just start looking around, start experimenting. Yeah, getting familiar. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I think any, it's like for the longest you had uh, folks not having a smartphone, right? And then now, like I look at my, um, I think she was 89 year old grandmother and she has a smartphone and she's like on Instagram, you know, like, so I I just think like, it's so important for um, people to just stay with the times and and be a student of things, you know, and and continue to learn. And so um, we are 
avid learners over here. Um, I wanted to ask you because um, you had in your title, uh, futurist, Uh you share with our audience, um, what is a futurist? Okay, so there are people who are professional futurists. I would like to become a professional futurist. So I have it in everywhere I can so that people can start noticing me as a futurist. I'm branding myself. Um, (laughs) So a futurist is basically somebody who studies trends, signals. I mean, in, in the futurist industry, they call it signals, but a signal can just be anything could be data, could be trends, could be, uh, like you said, you're just noticing what's going on in AI. You're just looking around, doing some research, um, touch points, things like that. Those are signals. And it's not really predicting the future. It's looking at those signals to come up with an insight and then using foresight to just come up with a position, a perspective on a particular thing. Like I could say AI is going to be a bullet point in everyone's job description. And then I could go out and look for some signals, some data on that to test, see if that's going to be right or not. And then I can start writing about it if I feel that position is the right one to take. Um, And then you use all that possibly to come up with solutions or new ideas or innovation, um, things like that. Yeah, this AI stuff is fascinating. A little scary. My husband's obsessed. He uh, is in tech and he's always talking about AI. Thank you for sharing about um, you being a futurist. Uh, So as a futurist and systems thinker, could you share how these uh, perspectives influence your approach to digital product development projects in the SaaS industry, especially in service design, design strategy and operations? Yeah, so using, um, I think it's a way of thinking using, for me, it's a way of thinking, um, futurism, um, forward thinking, system thinking. It's a mental model that I that I use, that I study, that I um, take courses, read books on. I thought I had my book here, but there's a book, Systems Thinking, that I'm reading right now. Lots of books on this stuff. Um, I'm fascinated with it. And I think it's a way I go to work and I can come up with a idea and bring it to the workplace, bring it to the marketplace that nobody else is going to come up with. And that's kind of how I feel like it's useful to me um, and why I value it, because it kind of unlocks a different way of thinking or going about things um, in your mind. Love that. Um I I did not know what a futurist was um, and had or a while back and was looking at, I kept seeing it kind of pop up here and there on people's LinkedIn profiles. And so I'm like, that's a term I haven't heard in a, you know, ever heard in my life. So I, I started researching and I was um, pretty fascinated with that. So I can definitely see you as a futurist. So I'm oh, glad that you, you are putting it. You heard uh, it here first. <laughs> yeah, but in the way that you think, and we have had so many conversations, um, you know, outside of uh this conversation. So I definitely see that for you. Um, And one thing I'm super excited to talk about is you describe yourself as an amplifier um, and a value thought partner, helping black women and BIPOC individuals in the tech industry unlock their zone of genius. Um, You also started building Bloomology for black women in tech. Um, Tell me a little bit more about that, like how you're amplifying voices like through your, your passion project right now. Yeah, so um, I think it's just a gift that I discovered through being a people leader for the first time. Um, Most of my career, I've been an individual contributor. I've now gone back to being an individual contributor. Um, It's just where I enjoy most. But um, while I was a people leader, I always was able to see like, well, what are the what are the it things with this person? And how are do they have maybe some some gifts or some skills that aren't unlocked 
or are they suppressing something that needs to come out as a skill or or are they being gaslit about or their are they being gaslit or you their, know yeah yeah or are they just downplaying because of their experiences and trauma or whatever like whatever's the thing I've always loved to like just kind of study that person and then help them and I just find so much joy in doing that so I just love doing that I love that well tell us about your your um bloomology as well Yep. Yeah, so you're saying that right. I want to make sure I'm saying that. Yeah, you're correctly. saying it right. Okay, so good. bloomology is uh, kind of a play on words. Um, black women in tech in full bloom. So black women technology bloomology. So um, and it's kind of like I love flowers. I love like making floral arrangements randomly. So it's kind of like that whole flowering watering process that's the meaning behind it and um I have two sides of it one is going to be bloom me media and Demisha is one of my early uh supporters she uh un helped to unlock that part of it so bloom media is going to be a media company um focused around black women uh, in tech or black and also black women in their careers, whether they're uh, side hustling, also have a job, moms working, trying to navigate that, that kind of thing. Um, so it's just going to be a media space for that. Uh, think some of the things we already have now, Blavity or Essence, but kind of focused on career. Um, and then Bloomology is going to be my career development and leadership development training arm. So those are the two sides of it. Nice. I, I love it. Nice. I love those names. And I love that Demisha is involved. This is, <laughs> and um, on that note of, of cute names, your podcast. Um, so you're hosting Talk Your Sass. Uh, it must provide a platform for insightful conversations. Can you share a memorable moment or conversation from your podcast that left a lasting impact on you or your listeners? I'm immediately thinking of this salary negotiation episode, which was one of my first episodes that I did on the podcast. Um, and I got so much feedback from that, so much uh testimonials of people who used some of the stuff I said in, in real life and then they wrote back to me which was great um but I kind of led with the perspective that if you don't negotiate your salary and you don't have a history of negotiating your salary it has like a compounding lifelong impact and I don't think people say that enough because now you're impacting not only salary, like base pay, people think about base pay, but now you don't have the ability to grow 401k like you need to. You might not have stock options like you need to. You might not have severance protection like you, like you, like you might need. Um, and then this goes into like home ownership and like having money to like, I don't know, buy an investment property which you could have save even, you know, save money or save yeah. or emergency like money. emergency. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you think about how like the trickle down to so many areas of your finance and your wealth building um, opportunities, I think you'll start to think differently than it's not just base pay or just saying, you know, I want a $10,000 raise. Like it's your whole financial life picture. I know that's really important. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I wanted to make a comment about, because I love that you touched on um, just salaries and negotiation and how it just affects people long-term, you know? Um, and I am so thankful to Arlen Hamilton for writing her book, Your First Million. I just want to shout this out because um, I read it the first day that I got it. <laughs> so, um, and it had so many gems in it. And I think that we can't rely on one 
stream of income, it is so important to have skill sets outside of your work, you know, and to be able to diversify and try new things and, you know, create those dreams. So if you are looking to do that, I definitely um, would pick up her book. Um, again, we'll put it in the, the description below, but um, I just wanted to, is a book fresh in my mind because I just read it. So I um, wanted to shout that out. Yeah. And let me add her buddy, Rachel Rogers book. What is it? Yes. Called? Oh, we should all be millionaires. It's yes. back there. So. Yep. Um, I didn't read that in a day. That's impressive. Uh, I read it very quickly though, because it also had tons of gems, especially around this product of, I mean, this topic of, um, the ask, because she talked about it, not only like from her being a former lawyer, but also in her business. And she first started out like, totally not negotiating like her rates and charging like super low. Um, so yeah, the, I would say maybe combine. Read, read Absolutely. Both them, but, yeah. yeah. And if you can go to one of her events or um, I actually attended a virtual event of hers and it was a game changer. So I was just starting off at my entrepreneur journey and I'm so grateful. I don't know how I came across it, but um, the algorithm worked in my favor. So um, <laughs> if you see any of her events or follow her on social media, both her and Arlen, um, but really great books, both of them. Um, I have a question that we ask everybody. Uh, all of our Sunday Soul Day guests, which is um, how do you prioritize self care? Like I know you are managing your work, your your projects, you know, your building yeah. businesses, media company, your wife, a mom. Um, how do you feel your mind, body, and soul? Um, I would say hobbies. I would say routines. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I, what I mean by that is scheduling things that you enjoy, not putting self-care off because you think it's like so big. You think you have to do like a spa day, a vacation, a beach, uh, a trip, like no, because then you'll be waiting. You'll be postponing self-care until those dates, or you'll be postponing self-care until you like have a win or a milestone. But for me, I just find ways to practice self-care every day, whether that's like blocking out time to read, sticking to my morning routine, which I am like, it's a non-negotiable. Um, <laughs> if I don't have the morning routine, things are not right. So yes, sticking to my practices in the morning, the things that I want to do, uh, I wake up super early so that I can have my time uninterrupted. Um, and not just like from the people in my house, but like uninterrupted from the world. <laughs> like I just want to be alone, period. Like with my thoughts, my personal space, like the whole thing. So, and just finding little hobbies. Like I just got... Uh, Oh, it's not here. Oh, this is one. I just got uh these little skin tone colors. I'm going to start coloring. I was not really into the adult coloring, but I think I'm going to try it. Just trying new things to relax um, or to build into your self-care. I think it's like a toolkit. So like to put in your toolkit. It's not just one thing or one thing could work for this one stress but then it might not work for the stress that's like making you want to run under your desk. So mm -hmm. I think you've got to have different methods, hobbies, passions, tools in your toolkit for, for self-care because you don't know what's going to happen. So I love that you have a toolkit. I mean, um, in our last episode, we shared some of the things that we do, and I have a toolkit for mind, body, and soul, and I pull from it daily. Um, I love that you get up early. We had a guest on um, in our season one opener. Um, she, her name is uh, Ashley Ellington Brown, and she's the author of A Beautiful Morning, and in the book, oh, it's all- that. Did you? Oh my goodness. That book was a game changer for me. And I was it so sure grateful is. 
to have her on because I, I like sh- I kept telling her, you don't know how much you helped me. You know, I was a new mom when I when I got it of two small kids and just was not pouring into myself, you know. So I love that yeah. you do that. You're really just pouring into yourself. So then you can give to yeah. your family, you can give to, you know, your community as well as, you know, work. And so um I love that that you mentioned that. Yeah, I love that you you also have a toolkit. I learned about the toolkit from therapy, though. So, Ali, one of your great professional uh, counterparts. And, um, yeah, just keep putting things in the toolkit. Try things. Don't just, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad that you just mentioned the mom part because some things that might have worked, I find, like, as a mom, some things might have worked for you in the self-care or wellness space when the kids were uh, six months. It may not work when the kid is six. So you got to have different things. I love your, uh, you, you sharing your combination between having routines and trying new things like the coloring. I think that that's really great. And then trying different things at different phases of your life and of your children's lives as well. So thank you. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of books, but I'm wondering if you have any other book or podcast recommendations for our audience that uh, have been instrumental in your journey. Things I gotta bring them to top of mind. Women Evolve by Sarah Jakes Roberts. Uh, that was amazing in the give yourself grace uh, aspect of life, which at one point in time I needed a lot of work there. Um, yeah, so that was instrumental in that and in speaking into that uh, area. Um, I think it's called Now. Let me just look it up really quickly because it's a recent book. Tolbert, Eli Tolbert. Oh, The Power of Now? Is that what you're thinking of? Yes, The Power of Now. Incredible book. By Eckhart Tolle. Yes, Egbert Tolley. It is. I totally like like switch that whole name around. I do um, thing all the time. So terrible with names, especially Denisha and I both read or listen to so many books. I get. I know, me too. And you just listen to so much stuff. But um, that book, if you need to think about, if you're like saying you don't have enough time, if you're living in the past, if you're holding on to a past version of yourself. That's an essential read. Um, yeah, because I just love how he just flat out like the only thing that matters is this moment. Like, and when you think about it, we cannot go back ever. We cannot go to the future. So, like, why do we spend so much time fluctuating here or there when the only thing we have is just present? Like, we don't have anything else. Right, right. Yeah. In recovery, we say yesterday's history, tomorrow is a mystery. Now is a present. Now is a gift. That's why we call it the present. I knew I was going to love that. That's an amazing quote. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I honestly think it's the difference between living in, you know, fear and love. And when you're really present and you're loving yourself, loving the moment, loving your life, loving, you know, just living more in love, you remain a lot more rooted and present. Um, But when you are thinking about the past or letting it, you know, bring harm to you or fear, same with the future, you're thinking about the future, you're worried about the future, worried about this. So I think it's a difference between both states. I totally agree. Well, so far, I'm just like, I'm loving this conversation and I wish I could talk to you uh, longer, um, but wanted to just ask you, like, you know, you want to do just extraordinary things. Like, what legacy do you hope to leave in the tech industry or even with, with Bloomology? Um, so I took this test the other day that's like. It, it, mm, not a personality test, but it was from, we have a leading uh, organization, professional organization in UX called Nielsen Norman. And he's just, it's just like a famous uh, UX person and they offer courses and training and blah, blah, blah. 
But anyway, they had a test and I took it and it said that my my UX leadership style or superpower is uh what did I what did it say? And now I forgot the name of it. Um basically a person that connects perspectives. But let me get the exact name of it for you. Oh, an interpreter. And the whole thing was about communication. And I was just like, this is so spot on to just who I am and who I'm working towards being. Um, and it said that you're essentially you're very skilled in convincing people, but also like educating people on two different perspectives working together or new perspectives um, and bringing that to life. And I just thought that that was so powerful because that's what I want to do. I want to allow people to unlock certain things within themselves, their thinking, their mindset, their practices um, that just open them up to new opportunities, new possibilities. And that's the work I'm doing with Bloomology. Uh, Bloom Media, and some of the other things that I'm working on as well. So futurist, like we said, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. It's perfect. It is yeah. perfect. And I, I I, meant it when I said that. So I, I'm not even surprised by your results. Uh, make sure you put that somewhere on LinkedIn. Uh, I well, am. I have it ready. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Well, um, I want to just ask you, because I know that we didn't touch on, you're also a speaker. Um, mm -hmm. Where can people connect with you? Like what's up next for you? Do you have any engagements or, or any talks coming up that people can um, join in on? Um, I had a recent one last week um, and that went so well. It was about uh, self-leadership and how you can um, become iconic in your IC career in UX. It was called the iconic framework. And that went so well that I think I'm going to offer like a power hour session for people. Um, I'll put that on LinkedIn once I create the offer, but just a power hour so I can give people a plan of action, um, a roadmap for their career if they're an IC. Um, and then we can just talk through strategy, plan of action. I love that. Love. Uh, well, let me know when that's happening. I will definitely help promote on my end. But um, wanted to um, just also ask, like, where can people connect with you? Like, or is yeah. it best on LinkedIn? Is it Instagram? It's best. On, uh, well, I'm in both places. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, on Instagram, Jenna Bewent. And then um, the Bloomology has its own page on Instagram. And that's uh, the Bloomology effect. So you can go there as well. Um, I also have this incredible career journal coming out. Um, so a lot of the thing I was excited when we were had our section about one-on-ones and feedback and skip levels and preparing your notes. And um, I caught in my phone, I actually just looked at it. My folder in my phone, I have a folder for, it's called Celebration of Me. And I just screenshot anything that happens, whether it's at work, whether it's on Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and it goes in there. And so I can, you know, like we said, documentation is everything. Um, so I just document, document, document. So if I'm lost, blocked, having a bad day, whatever, I just go look in there and then I feel better. I love that. We actually had another guest on that encouraged us to do a, what was it? A brag book journal or something? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm coming out with my own brag book journal. It's not called that. Of course it has a better name. I think that's um, great and such a good modeling to our children, right? That we are allowed to talk yeah. about ourselves. We are yeah. allowed to celebrate ourselves. So yep. thank you so much, Geneva, for this conversation and sharing your experience and some of the hardships you've gone through in tech. I know that that's going to resonate and help so many people. So thank you. And it was just wonderful thank to meet you. you. It was so good meeting you, Ali. Uh, Demisha, thanks for having me. I uh, love this show. Love what you all are working on and can't wait to keep listening and supporting.
Thank you so much. And just appreciate you saying yes. And we're so grateful that you graced the show. Your story, you know, I had known it. I couldn't wait to share it with everyone. Um, and I just love your vulnerability today. Um, so I wanted to call that out. And thank you so much for sharing your zone of genius with us, as well as all the amazing things that you are working on. And we can't wait to support you and we will be cheering you on. And um, I can't wait to hear your next talk too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and to everyone, you have a wonderful Sunday. And also um, go ahead and put in the comments uh, your favorite part of this interview. Bye everyone.